Uh, welcome, Jeff. Thank you. You are the CEO of uh, Chroma. Uh, Chroma has raised about $20 million in uh, venture funding, most recently an $18 million seed round, large seed round, yep. uh, led by uh, Quiet Capital with like a bunch of uh, famous people. Uh, from the valley and beyond uh, as angel investors. So congratulations on the on the, all the success um, so far. Thank We'd you. love to maybe start with your background. What led you to uh, start Chroma and what were you doing uh, before that? Yeah, for sure. Um, most previous to Chroma, I worked on a YC-backed company for about seven years. Um, long journey, lots of stories I could share. Um, I think the one thing that I learned most poignantly, poignantly during that time was the the difficulty and pain um, it required to turn a machine learning model from demo to production. Um, it's just so hard to get any level of reliability out of these things. Any level of nines, even ninety percent, can be quite difficult in a lot of cases. Um, so this was a, a shared pain with my co-founder Anton as well. Um, he had worked on ML at Neuro and Facebook. Um, and you know, we thought that there was a thought there was a better way. Uh, we wanted to make the tool that we wanted to have when we were developing machine learning applications. Um, and so we started down this exploration of trying to understand how um, an interpretability of latent space by looking at embeddings. We can get into some more definitions here that might be helpful. Um, by looking at embeddings, um, doing embedding search, doing analytics over embedding space, um, you could give developers. Um, you know, at the minimum of a divining rod, if not a compass, to be able to improve their models and get to the level of reliability they want to have in their applications. Great, great. And so when did you start the company? We uh, did the pre-seed round in May, April of last year. Oh, that's true. Okay, so it's still very new. Okay. Yeah, so you've, you've like, done a, know, 14 months or something like that. Yeah, so. you've done a terrific job uh, you. sort of bursting onto the scene because uh, uh, you uh, don't come across as a 14-month-old uh, company, so well, well done on that. Yeah. Um, all right, so let, let's jump into it. Uh, what is Chroma first at a high level? And then we'll, we'll get into some definitions as you um, suggested uh, around embeddings, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, what Chrome is today, what Chrome is going to be in the fullness of time, um, all of these things are interesting. I'll talk about today, because that's the most honest. Uh, they might land the best. Um, so Chroma is an open source vector database. Um, our goal is to give developers the tools to create programmable memory for language models. Um, language models are obviously incredibly powerful, incredibly useful, um, but difficult to, to tame. Um, you know, the, the Shoggoth meme comes to mind. For those of you that are uh, terminally online, like myself, um, the you know green monster with all the tentacles and eyes all over it. And um, you know, how do we tame this beast? How do we tame this beast and make it useful and reliable? Um, and Chroma's belief is that uh, programmable memory, so developers being able to set terministically, hey, language model, this is the knowledge you should know about. This is the knowledge you should use. These are the tools you should know about. These are the tools you should use, how to use them, um, uh, poses a path to, again, bringing language models into every use case, being able to depend on them, rely on them. Um, I won't say make them aligned, um, but maybe that too. So. Okay, great. So we're still, uh, you know, early as a community, learning about all the things. So um, vector database enables one to store and process embeddings. Sure. Uh, what is an embedding? And sure. Why does it matter? Yeah, for sure. Um, so an embedding is just a point in higher dimensional space. So you can imagine a map as you know latitude and longitude. You place a pin on the map. You have two numbers: latitude and longitude. And that gives you some semantic idea of what that point means. It's on the continent of North America. It's near other cities, right? You can sort of cluster and you can understand that point's context given its neighbors. Um, embedding spaces are not two-dimensional. They're hundreds of dimensions or thousands of dimensions, or even tens of thousands of dimensions. And they're usually trained, the models that generate these embeddings, embeddings is a fancy word for a list of numbers. It's literally just a list of numbers that represents a point. Um, are usually trained what's called around contrastively learned for semantic similarity. So the idea is that like statements will be near each other in embedding space. You already saw some of this stuff from our earlier demos. Um, so a good example of this that I always use is if you're trying to search a HR knowledge base for what your company's time off policy is, 
um, you know, maybe you're using the wrong language. Maybe you're saying, hey, what's my time off policy? But you also want to get back if you're a European, the company's holiday policy. If you're an American, the company's vacation policy. Um, all three of those things are semantically similar. And so a good embedding model would retrieve those sections of the HR's knowledge base and bring them back either to you, the person who searched it, or to the language model for further synthesization. Um, and that ability to do fuzzy matching is, is quite helpful, or fuzzy search is, is quite useful and quite powerful over conventional text search, which is, you know, you'll have a lot of misses. Yes, um, and at, a, at an even higher level, uh, you need to turn all of this into numbers because that's what machine learning models want. Correct, yeah. At a technical level, one way to understand it is you're taking unstructured data, text, images, etc., and you are vectorizing it. You're yeah. turning it into numbers that mean something, that have semantic meaning, um, and that allows you to do things like uh, at prompt time, when a user types a prompt into a box or other, be able to figure out at prompt time what is the relevant information we need right now? Yeah. And then pull that into the context window and kind of do this. I like to use the analogy from the matrix. Uh, so, you know, when Tank downloads the information in Neo's brain for how to do Kung Fu, and then he has the famous line, I know Kung Fu, and he goes and fights Morpheus, and it's awesome. Um, that idea of being able to download instructions into the brain of something so that it can then go do something useful, I think is quite analogous in obviously like an abstraction, but it's quite analogous to. The, the power that a vector database uh, can bring to a language model. And, and the step that's upstream from you guys, and I, I don't think that you do that because you focus on the storage part, but the, the conversion, yeah. how is that typically done? Mm -hmm. um, are there like names that people should know in terms of uh, models and companies that do the conversion? Yeah, exactly. So there are language models. I'm sure many of you, all of you hopefully have used ChatGPT and you're pretty familiar with what that is. Um, there are also something called embedding models. And the output of an embedding model is not a paragraph of text that goes into a chatbot. The output of an embedding model is this list of numbers. So an embedding model is still a machine learning model. It's still trained. Uh, OpenAI has one called Ada2 that just got today 75% cheaper. Um, there are also closed source embedding models from Cohere. Um, Google Palm has one. Um, and then there is a plethora of open source embedding models as well that many of the people many people in the community find to be very good actually so okay uh, so you're an enterprise user you got a bunch of like text content or audio or video you fit it into those machine learning models and then you store the results in vector format into chroma that's, that's right the, so the workflow is take your documents this is the kind of the, the most classic workflow if you will take your documents could be again your knowledge bases your documentation uh, you saw a demo of like a, you know, WeWork S1, whatever. Um, uh, break it into small pieces, pass it to the embedding model. The embedding model turns each small piece of text. Um, you can also do images, but let's use text for this analogy. Each small piece of text into a number. And then all of those numbers and all of that text gets loaded into this database and becomes quickly and uh, searchable, which is the, is the fundamental thing that you need to be able to do. Um, is not just brute force through the whole thing, which can be quite slow at scale. Um, even small scale, um, but what you want to be able to do is, you know, get response time in you know, tens of milliseconds. So okay, so what does uh, Chroma do today? So obviously the core mission, as we just uh, discussed, uh, store and process um, uh, embeddings. Uh, but there's there's a list of features in terms of like what 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 you do now. Maybe what you will do soon. What, what are some of those key aspects? Yeah, I think our focus is around developer experience. So all of the work that we've done thus far is trying to meet developers early as possible in their life cycle um, and make the technology simple, understandable. You know, you go to the website, even the design of the website is meant to be like calm and you can, it's, I promise you can learn this. It's not that hard. It's really not hard. Um, so, um, you know, the kinds of features that we're excited about, um, so the things that we're working on broadly. Um, we're working on a distributed version of Chroma. So in the same way that Elastic, uh, for those of you that are familiar with text search, Elastic picked up Lucene, made it developer friendly, they made it distributed. Chroma picks up some of these ANN algorithms. Go into what that means. Uh, we made it developer friendly and now we're making it distributed. Again, all in open source. That's on the scale vector. And then the other vector is making it usable and understandable. Um, 
you know, if you look at a uh, conventional database, relational database, Postgres, MySQL, et cetera, it's basically 2D data. You can put it on a screen. You can immediately understand what's going on. It's extremely intuitive. It's 2D data. It's a table. You've all used Excel. Um, this data is not 2D. It might be hundreds or thousands of dimensions. Um, and you know, we think that, again, there's, there's a large gap to make this technology really usable and interpretable to humans, to developers who are building these applications. And so there's a large swath of like features of functionality which we're excited to bring to developers. So just to give you one example of this, um, and again, a lot of this work is like still fully in open source. Um, and one of the things that developers who adopt this technology or related technologies face, these questions they face are questions like, how do I chunk up my document? Like how large or small should these pieces be? Which embedding model should I use for my application? How many nearest neighbors should I be picking? because that's kind of a, a feature of this task, right? You have to pick, do I want three nearest neighbors or 10? And then are these nearest neighbors relevant or not? Um, and for all of these questions, this is the classic workflow. Every developer faces all of these questions. The best answer today is just try it out. We have no idea. Um, and we think that there's a large opportunity as well to, to bring applied research to bear on that problem and give developers, again, better tools to be able to answer these questions and build more reliable applications more quickly. Very good. You are uh, very proudly open source. Do you want to talk about uh, this? Why? How do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of strategic reasons, et cetera, et cetera, you can get into. And I mean, maybe in the context of like a VC pitch, that would be relevant. I think, I mean, the, the honest truth is because it's awesome um, and it's really fun. And I want to do things in my life with people that is awesome and fun. And so that's why. Um, you know, I think on the kind of the comp side, right? There's plenty of, uh, there's a long history of uh, open source databases that have also been able to monetize well and monetize in a way that the community loves. You can look at Mongo, Elastic, many examples of this. So I think the monetization story is really aligned with the community, um, which is maybe unique, right? Other open source products, there's it's, it gets a bit more contentious. So For the open source uh, geeks out there, what license do you have? Apache 2. Apache 2, okay. And uh, you alluded to a cloud product. Um, is that that's coming up, or you have it already? I, uh... Yeah, yeah, it's not live yet. We're working hard on it. Okay. Um, yeah, the reason we're doing it is not to really make money. Um, the reason we're doing it is because it's what the community wants. Um, the meme internally has been when hosted. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, developers love building stuff, especially application developers, web developers, mobile developers love to build. They don't really want to manage their own infrastructure. Um, and so while they love the experience of using Chroma on their own computer, uh, we don't have a good story yet for how they go to the cloud or to production. Um, and so part of the idea with Chroma is it'll be the same API everywhere from running it in a Jupyter notebook running it on your local computer or running it in the cloud. And so that's Okay, so you're, that's you're going to have doing. a self-hosted version, so you're going to have open source cloud and sort of self-deployable, self-hosted? Yeah, of course. I mean, Chrome will always, are, we are committed to building the ubiquitous open source standard. Yep. And so a, a truly non-kneecapped open source database has to exist. Yep. Um, I think that that's the, A, the ethically right thing to do, and then B, it's honestly pretty strategic as well. Like you see projects that try to like, have it both ways, you know, like try to like, oh, well, it's you can host it yourself, but it doesn't have these three critical features. Good luck. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's dumb. Okay. Uh, the, the vector database space has been super fun to watch recently because it's a term that hardly anybody knew what feels like a year ago. And suddenly there seems to be a number of players that are claiming to be great vector databases. And maybe that's all. Uh, correct. Um, how should we think about all those companies? Are you all largely going in the same direction and it's a race to like whoever builds the most feature the, the fastest or are the different approaches? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I respect all of our comp competitors, all of our competition. Um, I think everybody means well. I think everybody wants to do the right thing. Um, but I'll speak to what we care about. Um, and what we care about is developer productivity and happiness. Um, and you know, I think that's hopefully evident in the, what we've what we've made thus far, and hopefully will be true about what we will do in the near future and long in, long into the future. Um, 
And how yeah. should one look at this if you're a developer and you're comparing solutions? Is that a question? That, so there's, there's developer experience, so uh, how easy it is, documentation, all the things. Yeah. Is, there, is there a concept of uh, performance? And if so, how do you measure it for a vector database? What, yeah. what are the various um, axes for, to, for one to make a selection? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a, again, nobody knows the future, certainly not me. Um, there's an interesting open question, which is what will the primary workloads look like? I'll try to avoid using over, overly database jargon. Um, what will the workloads look like? Will they be more transactional? Meaning it's sort of a classic database, you're constantly querying it and updating it, deleting stuff. Will it be more analytical, where you wanna like slurp in the whole database and then do some analytics process over the whole thing? Um, or will it be both? Um, will actually both be important? And um, we, we fall in the latter camp. So the, the acronym here, for, again, for the database geeks would be HTAP, um, Hybrid Transactional Analytical Processing. Um, and we think that both certainly transactional has to be the case because it is a online database. It's gonna sit in the loop of applications. Again, you've already seen demos of this happening tonight. Um, but also to make this technology useful for developers, you do wanna slurp in the whole database and analyze it in a bunch of different ways. And so that's an analytical process. And so. Um, again, to not go too deep on database jargon here, but we think that both are really important. And I think that, again, without getting into some details, um, again, that's unique. That we have a unique perspective on that. And uh, talking about go to market a little bit, what are some of the early learnings and lessons in terms of the range of use cases that people use Chroma for? Yeah. I think, I mean, the most common use case is what you would think. It's, your, it's the chat, your data use case, mm -hmm. um, which again, you've seen a bunch of demos already tonight. Um, you know, on and, and one level, you're sort of, I think it's fair to trivialize that and say, this is the newspapers on the internet moment. Um, you know, <laughs> web, web 1.0, the internet came, what are we gonna do? Let's put newspapers on the internet. You know, it's just sort of like pattern matching. We already know how to do this, now let's do it in this way. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the secondary observation is that's not wrong all newspapers are on the internet now. And, uh, you know, arguably are much more successful because of the internet. Um, so I think that use case, even just the chat your data use case, truly will go to the ends of the earth. Um, I think the more, the new use cases you're starting to see emerge um, are the, is the ability to give uh, LLM software agents their own memory. Um, especially in the context of like multi-agent interac interactive things. So you think seen things like baby AGI or auto GPT. Um, there's recently a project called Voyager that used Chroma on the back end for you know the vector storage and retrieval. Um, you know, that I think is really interesting and is is native to AI. Like you couldn't do that before AI. Um, so it's truly native to AI. Um, and that's really exciting. Now, of course, for those of you that have actually Play to the technology. I think it's questionable whether the current state of the art language models, embedding models, et cetera, will give you the reliability you want from uh, you know agents working together. Uh, but it almost certainly seems like the future. And on that point of reliability, um, you know, a, a, a point that uh, is very important in, in all of this discussion that we haven't really quite made yet is that vector databases are a way for companies to limit the hallucination problem. That's right. Did you want to just double click on that? Yeah, there's maybe maybe some nuance here, which is interesting. Um, so hallucinations are you ask the language model to do something, it kind of ignores you, and it just makes something up. There's a famous case recently where uh, a lawyer was caught using it in a brief to a judge, and the judge you know, rightfully shamed him. Um, so the solution to hallucinations is to give the language model the information you want it to have. Um, and again, through this vector search, vector retrieval process that we've been talking about tonight. Um, so it's a grounding task. And literally the prompt construction that you typically see here is, you know, hi, language model, please do not make anything up. If you don't know, say, I don't know. <laughs> Only consider the following documents. One, two, three. Now answer the following question, question. Uh, and that's the, the prompt that's being built on the back end and how the, those, again, those documents from vector search are being inputted and then how the prompt from the user is getting slotted in. And then that's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the state of the art today. So there's lots of stuff around 
steering language models at the embedding layer itself and not using text. Um, but this is not yet exposed to, um, to at least closed source models. So. So while we're on the topic of um, how uh, enterprises, companies use um, vector databases, where, where does that fit? That seems to be an emerging stack mm. around like foundation models and you know the sort of link chains of the world. Like like who does what? And yeah. if you're today, your your you know your Moody's today, we would say which is kindly hosting us, and you want to build your own generative AI stack, so. Yeah. Clearly, you use Chroma, uh, but wh sure. what else uh, do you need to have? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's emerging as the right label, um, and so we will see. Um, you know, reasoning by analogy, uh, the you know, really building with language models is a new way of building software. Um, it's a way of building software that would have been impossible to program by hand. You know, just by simply typing into the black box of a language model, hey, language model. Here's a paragraph of text. Tell me whether this is happy or sad. That's something that's so easy to do now with the new primitives that we have available that even just a year ago would have been extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. Would have taken entire research organizations years potentially to build. I mean, maybe not that quite that complex for a simple semantic classification task, but still uh, much more difficult. Um, so for this like new way of building software, again, it won't necessarily eat all existing ways of building software, but it's certainly a new way of building software. Um, a stack will emerge. And I think, again, reasoning by history, by analogy, what do you have? You have databases. It's where you store stuff. Um, you have application code. It's where you encode your business logic about kind of guiding the task, what you want it to do. Um, you have your inputs and your outputs. Um, You've got some UI. I'm not sure how much that's going to change with AI. And then, um, you know, I guess the LLM in my mind is sort of like a, uh, you know, a, a super business logic black box plugin. Um, so I think that that basic model will probably still hold, where you have things that things that look like databases, pretty much things that look like application code, pretty much. Um, again, the language model is sort of a new thing in some ways, um, and then it'll be different than it has been before as well. You know, reasoning by analogy, obviously, to be careful of how far you take it. Um, you know, we think the database will be like much thicker than it's been before. Um, you know, Postgres is not doing analytics over your Postgres data to help you understand your Postgres data. I've already talked about tonight. You know, the idea that I think that's really valuable and important. Um, I think obviously, too, you know, language models will be in the loop of a lot of these things. And so, whilst we want to try to separate them cleanly and have these clean lines and abstractions. Um, everything truthfully will be more, you know, shades of gray in between um, all these components. Um, and there'll be language models running inside the application code, obviously, language models running inside the database as well, um, or large models more broadly, multimodal models will run, you know, everywhere as well. Um, so it probably won't be super clean, but I think it'll be more or less like what we've seen before. Great, great. Uh, one last question from me, because then I want to open up to folks, Drew over there as a microphone, which hopefully works. Um, sort of like zooming way back out, uh, wh where do you think we are in a year or two from now in generative AI? Is that just deployed everywhere? Like, what's your vision of the kind of a short term future? I think the long term future. So maybe three to five years from now. Two years is this like dead zone of prediction, right? Like you can predict the next week <laughs> and you can predict the fire future, but like don't try to predict two or three years out because you're always going to be wrong. Um, so the farther future is uh, intelligence too cheap to meter. Intelligence built into every product, every service that we use. Um, you know, intelligence too cheap to meter, hopefully leading to a lot more flourishing for all of humanity um, alongside clean energy too cheap to meter. Um, so like that's the big vision. I think, you know, where will we be three years from now? Um, I certainly think probably most enterprises, organizations, companies on Earth will have brought language models into the company, probably in pretty meaningful ways. Um, at minimum, the customer service department, the sales department, ops, back end, legal, um, and hopefully also the core product experience that they develop to they deliver to users, um, to their customers. So that seems like a safe bet. So I'm willing to make that bet. Great. Awesome.
All right, Drew, one question here. Got time for one more over here. Oh, where? Oh, sorry. Okay, well, you can uh, you can do this one and then finish with Tony. Yes. Hi, this is a question for Jeff. So, uh, real quick, when, for instance, vector database stop being just like information and retrieval information extraction and start being something else, like you mentioned, maybe the risk is the hallucination part, or like for instance, in the case of chat with your data, it is chatting with your information extraction. Well, it points to our uh, source of your data but when you're asking something else maybe mm. something of inference is maybe the the risk is that hallucination or like right. what it like what's currently what you were thinking of that next step or what yeah maybe chrome has been yeah i'm really glad you asked that um one of the things that we've been working on um is this idea of query relevancy or density so given retrievals from vector space given the search we can say whether it came from a sparse or dense part of the embedding space. Both are failure modes. Sparsity is the obvious one. So the user asked a question about this topic. We naively got the three nearest neighbors, but they were actually far away. And there actually should have been a kick out to say back to the application code, hey, we're really, this is not good. You know, you shouldn't trust this. Um, you know, maybe that goes and hooks in a human to actually say, hey, human, we don't know about this. Can you please answer this question? And then uh, there's a task to add that to the knowledge corpus and actually fill that hole in the embedding space. A database specifically, Chroma specifically, is not going to do all of this workflow, obviously. And we're not going to have like, you know, user code for typing in answers. Um, but uh, I think that idea of turning this like static database into something that knows what it knows and knows what it doesn't know, and allowing it to be alive and then allowing it to, to almost learn in a sense um is really exciting and is not again has nothing to do with postgres right has nothing to do with historical uh types of databases Great. all right last question here and then we'll go into the break sorry right, thanks to the next I'm, gonna, I'm gonna follow up on that question this everybody's you know everything's come from the generative the ai side i'm gonna ask this from the database side mm. it's sort of two-part question which I've been finding in vector databases all of a sudden, I mean, never heard of the term like three months ago. And all of a sudden, it seems like every week, hardly a week goes by that a new vector database comes in. I mean, mm -hmm. Matt, you've had like at least three or four in data driven the last few months. Um, what I'm wondering is two, two part question. One is, are vector databases databases in the set, in the conventional sense, or are they something else? Are they more of like a development platform for generative AI applications? If they are a database right now, obviously we're in early state of development. So every generative data, you know, every um, vector database is kind of like its own, you know, technology. I mean, maybe it's mm -hmm. open source or not, but like there are no standards. The mm -hmm. question is, will we need stand? I mean, if you look at the history of databases, the successful ones are ones where you had standards where you could develop a skills base. So maybe I'll ask: mm -hmm. Are standards relevant? Do we need standards here, or what will it take to develop a skills base? for, you know, for um, uh, vector databases. Yeah. You know, I alluded to it at the very beginning, but I don't actually like the term vector database that much. Um, I think it's sort of narrow. Um, I think the job to be done is information retrieval more broadly, and vector search happens to be a useful tool in our toolbox to doing information retrieval. Um, you know, I think uh, I, a, pl a platform is a word that gets tossed around a lot. I'm not exactly sure what it means. Um, you know, this certainly is a place that you store data and you search data and you retrieve data and you update data and you delete data. And so in that sense, it shares a lot of semantics with databases of old. Um, you know, you alluded to like a skills base, learning how to use this stuff. Obviously, the, the classical way of doing queries in databases is SQL, um, SQL. And... Um, you know, I don't, you know, I, people, there's this like, you know, big question about, oh, are vector databases going to replace classic databases? Are these comp competitive in some way? And um, I think it's just kind of a dumb question. Um, like vector databases are primarily about unstructured data. It's actually taking data that had no database that knew about it and loading it in for the very first time. Most applications of this stuff is not about taking data that's already in your relational database and making it searchable to a language model. 
Um, in those cases, you might want to just use uh, have the language model write the SQL query to go pull that information out of the database. That's actually probably the best way to do it. Um, so I think the I mean the future. I don't know. I've got ideas. We have you know some stuff up our sleeve around the scope of what um, a vector database or more broadly this like system might encompass. Um, but uh, but for now, you know, we're keeping our keeping our head on our shoulders and just trying to stay grounded and you know build a really good thing. So great. All right. Very good. That's a wonderful place to leave it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt.